Hello, my name is Robert Wilkes, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Campinas in Brazil. Uh, thank you to Juan and Maria for including me in this session, and to the Sao Paulo Research Foundation for funding this project. This paper will present the beginnings of my postdoctoral research into the depictions of the Brazilian landscape by British artists who visited Brazil in the 19th century, focused primarily on Charles Landseer and Marianne North, but with other artists included for comparative purposes, introducing a broader context for these two artists' visits to Brazil at different points in the 19th century. Now, why landscape? Well, it's the dominant visual theme that runs throughout these artists' works, documenting Brazil's natural splendor. In this paper, I will consider the current scholarly understanding of this topic from the perspective of British art history. I will then turn to Landseer and North, considering how two paintings by them can be used to trace changes in how artists depicted Brazil's landscapes during this century. Histories of British art have long acknowledged that British artists traveled to other countries and that these travels inspired their artistic output. I'm showing you here two examples. On the left, the painter William Daniel, who traveled to India from the mid 1780s until 1794 and continued painting Indian subjects after his return to England. The painting on the right was made by Thomas Seddon, an associate of the Pre-Raphaelites, who traveled to Egypt and Jerusalem in the mid 1850s and made landscape watercolors and oil paintings that he exhibited back in England. Seddon actually died in Cairo in 1856. There is already a large body of scholarly literature about this area of British art history. Most of these texts published from the mid 20th century until now have focused on artistic travel within the territories of the British Empire, India, for example, or to regions where there was a strong British colonial presence. Museum exhibitions have also explored this trend. For example, the Lure of the East, British Orientalist painting in 2008 to nine and Artist and Empire facing Britain's imperial past in 2015 to 16. Travel within Europe has also been well documented, particularly artistic tourism in countries like Italy. One region that, which has received less attention in British art history is South America. And my research focuses on Brazil. The close historical relationship between Britain and Brazil, especially in the 19th century, has been examined as part of transatlantic historical studies. See books like Richard Graham's uh, Britain and the Onset of Modernization in Brazil from 1968, and Leslie Bethel's The Abolition of the Brazilian Slave Trade, Britain, Brazil, and the Slave Trade Question from 1970. These texts have analyzed the political, economic, and industrial connections between the two countries, but there are no discussions of art history. The subject of historical Anglo-Brazilian relations and the British imperial presence in Brazil remains something of a niche topic uh, in Britain. It is not taught in schools, for example, and many Britons are unaware that Britain was closely involved with Brazil during the 19th century. And in fact, the historian Dominic Sandbrook recently noted that, quote, the details of Brazil's history are largely unknown to British readers, unquote. As such, the histories of British art have failed to include Brazil in the map of foreign territories which British professional and amateur artists made a habit of visiting. Interestingly, this subject is actually more familiar in Brazil than it is in the artist's home country. In the 20th century, Brazilian museums and collectors purchased British artworks as part of a wider effort to create a visual archive of works made in Brazil by foreign traveling artists, particularly from Europe. Painters like Franz Post, Johann Moritz Rugendas, uh, Nicolas Antoine Tournay, and Jean Baptiste Debray. Works by British artists depicting Brazilian subjects. I'm showing two examples here by Henry Chamberlain and Thomas Lyde Hornbrook, can be found in the Museo de Arte de São Paulo, the Pinacoteca de São Paulo, and the uh, Museo Casa Gueira 
and the Museo da Chacra do Seu in Rio de Janeiro. I apologize for my pronunciations of those names. Even so, it is worth noting that most of these Brazilian studies have focused on artworks produced in the earlier decades of the 19th century, the 1820s and 1830s, uh, the Georgian period. My current research also considers individuals who traveled to Brazil later in the century at the height of the Victorian period, such as Marianne North in the 1870s and uh, Margaret Tolmash in the 1850s. I am also approaching the topic from a different perspective as a specialist in British rather than Brazilian art. Another reason for the subject's neglect by historians of British art is the fact that although there are a handful of oil paintings, such as the two shown on the previous slide, these artworks are largely ephemeral. They are mostly works on paper, either drawings and watercolors, like the example by Margaret Tolmash on the right, or printed media like this colored lithograph by the diplomat William Gore Ousley on the left. Works on paper are rarely on public display and the printed engravings, although they received wide circulation at the time, are today only familiar to specialists. Most of these artists are also defined as amateurs in that art was not their principal profession. Most were military officers, merchants, diplomats, or simply visitors who were curious enough about their new surroundings to want to record them on paper. There was very little professional painting done, although my research has been uncovering some Brazil-themed paintings exhibited at the Royal Academy in London during the 19th century. Therefore, these works do not fit into the standard canon of British art, which still prioritizes finished works of art, especially oil paintings, exhibited at prestigious venues uh, like the Royal Academy. This sets it apart from the rather more elevated Brazilian subject paintings by artists from other European countries. It's a rather more eccentric body of work. One of the few trained professional art, uh, painters who made the journey from Britain to Brazil was Charles Landseer. Landseer began studying painting at the Royal Academy in 1816, about 10 years before his trip to Brazil. This came about in 1825, when Landseer accompanied Sir Charles Stewart on a diplomatic mission organized by the British government. Landseer stayed in Brazil for just under a year, returning to England in May 1826 with a sketchbook full of drawings and watercolors documenting his travels. This sketchbook, known as the Highcliffe Album, is now in the Instituto Morales Salas in Brazil. When the album was auctioned at Christie's in London in 1999, the sales catalogue declared that Landseer's, quote, direct transcription of the scenery of Brazil has subsequently assumed a valuable historical dimension, preserving a vital iconography of the nation at a great moment, unquote. However, this does not seem to have, had re have resonated much with British art scholarship. The sketchbook is little known today, and virtually nothing has been written about it in Landseer's home country. Even Landseer himself is an obscure figure, long overshadowed by his younger brother, Sir Edwin Landseer, the favorite painter of Queen Victoria. After his return to England in 1826, Landseer developed some of his sketches into oil paintings for public exhibitions, such as this one, uh, a picturesque view of the Sugarloaf Mountain and Botafogo Bay as seen from the Aqueduct Road in Rio de Janeiro. It's interesting that Landseer did not choose the most obvious and prestigious venue for this, the Royal Academy, uh, which, held, which held annual summer exhibitions that were hugely popular. Instead, Landseer exhibited five Brazil paintings at the Society of British Artists and the British Institution in 1827 and 1828. These were smaller exhibition venues that had been set up as alternatives to the Academy, although they had an importance of their own. Landseer's painting was probably suggested by this small oil sketchbook, or oil sketch, sorry, um, in Landseer's album which uses a similar compositional device of a path running at diagonals along the lower edge of the picture with a small human figure and clusters of trees at the edges framing a view of the bay. As previous scholars have already noted, 
This drawing on the right of some butterfly catchers from the Highcliffe album probably uh, formed or did form the basis for the central group of black figures in the painting with some alterations of poses and costumes. Small human figures uh, within the landscape were a common pictorial device in picturesque landscape painting. They frequently appear in the 17th century works of Claude Lorraine, uh, Nicolas Poussin and Salvatore Rosa, who were admired by British painters in the 18th and early 19th centuries. The additional figure of a black man carrying a bundle of sticks in the foreground was likely inspired by similar drawings of enslaved men carrying items on their heads, which Landseer observed in the streets and documented in his sketchbook, such as this one on the right. It isn't an exact match, uh, but the striding pose and general costume are the same. Landseer also made several detailed studies of banana trees in his sketchbook, which no doubt informed his depictions of the same trees in the finished painting. Of course, the painting was done back in England uh, in Landseer's studio and not on the spot in Brazil. As mentioned earlier, besides this landscape, Landseer exhibited four other royal paintings at London, London institutions between 1827 and 1828. One of them was a genre subject showing, to quote the title, the interior of a Brazilian rancho in, this, in the province of Santo Paulo with a traveling merchant, his slaves, merchandise, etc. This is the painting on the left. There was also another landscape of Rio, a view of the chapel of the Conceição with the Corcovado in the background. The original oil painting is now untraced, but an idea of it can be gleaned from a watercolor study in the Highcliffe album on the right, uh, which is thought to have provided the basis for the lost painting. As previous scholars have noted, Landseer was unable to keep his Brazil sketchbook for very long after his return to England. He was compelled to give it to Sir Charles Stuart, and the sketchbook remained in the Stuart family's possession. This explains why Landseer was only able to paint a handful of oil paintings for exhibition using the, his sketches. He may well have made more if he had not been deprived of his sketchbook. An almost identical view of the Sugarloaf Mountain from the Aqueduct Road uh, is shown in this small oil painting on the right by Marianne North, done nearly 50 years later in 1872 or 73, while North was traveling in Brazil. This is one, over, this is one of over 100 paintings made by North in Brazil on permanent display in the Marianne North Gallery in the Royal Botanic Gardens near London. North herself financed the construction of this gallery, which opened to the public in 1882. In her autobiography, Recollections of a Happy Life, published posthumously in 1892, North recalled that she, quote, had long had the dream of going to some tropical country to paint its peculiar vegetation on the spot in natural abundant luxuriance, unquote. She also noted that English people at that time, quote, have but a very confused idea of the difference between North and South America, unquote. North's friendship with the Reverend Charles Kingsley partly inspired her choice of Brazil. In 1871, she asked him to send her a copy of Charles Mansfield's book, Paraguay, Brazil and the Plate, which Kingsley had edited in 1856. In 1872, North made the trip to Brazil, arriving at Pernambuco in August that year. She stayed in the country for about a year, returning to England in late August or early September 1873. Like Landseer, North, in this painting of the same view, has included the same tree, uh, the uh, Embaúba or Cecropia tree, um, on the left of the composition, um, in the branches of which hangs a sloth. However, North has moved away from the carefully composed picturesque elements present in Landseer's earlier work. Instead, she presents us with a closely cropped, particularized view of the landscape, like a snapshot. Our view of the sugarloaf is unhelpfully obstructed by the trees, as it would be in reality if we were walking along the path and stopped to glance at the scenery. The bright, crisp colors of North's painting contrast with the more subdued sepia tones of Landseer's picture. 
North's rendering of atmospheric perspective, the sugarloaf is painted in lighter blues in the background, feels truer to life than in Lancy's picture, in which the sugarloaf and surrounding hills in the background are rendered in the same sepia tones as the foreground. There is not much differentiation between the two. The idea that North's painting was done on the spot in Brazil is supported by her autobiography, in which she describes visiting the neighbourhood of Santa Teresa in Rio de Janeiro for artistic inspiration, and I quote, I spent some days in walking and sketching on the hills behind the city. Its aqueduct road was a great help to this enjoyment, being cut through the real forest about a thousand feet above the town and sea. In this neighbourhood I saw many curious sights, the cacropia or trumpet tree, trumpet tree was always the most conspicuous one in the forest with its huge white lined horse chestnut shaped leaves, young pink shoots and hollow stems. The most awkward of all animals, the sloth, uh, spent his dull life on the branches, slowly eating up the young shoots and hugging them with his hooked feet, prefer pre preferring to hang and sleep head downwards. North's written account of the landscape matches her painted representation of it very closely. And you can see that the sloth in the branches uh, is actually in the same position as she described it in her memoir uh, with its head downwards uh, hanging from the branch. It's possible to see in North's paintings the influence of the highly detailed landscape paintings of the Pre-Raphaelites made earlier in the 1850s. North was familiar with Pre-Raphaelite art. She met the painter Edward Lear and admired paintings by William Holman Hunt. She mentions this in her memoir. On the left uh, is a view inside some tropical woodland by North. And on the right, a painting by John William Inchbold from the 1850s showing a similar interest in meticulous natural detail. Pre-Raphaelite artists in the early 1850s were often criticised for their unconventional approach to the landscape. One of the first landscapes to be exhibited in the Pre-Raphaelite style was this painting by Charles Alston Collins, an associate of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, done in 1851. Collins simply painted the view looking across Regent's Park in London from a window at his parents' home. When it was exhibited at the Academy in 1852, Collins's picture was poorly received because it broke with the pictorial conventions of landscape painting. Collins had depicted a very commonplace uh, mundane sort of semi-urban scenery in painstaking detail. The picture led one reviewer to remark that for the Pre-Raphaelites, quote, the botanical uh, predominates altogether over the artistical. They take a branch, a flower, a blade of grass, place it close before them and as closely copy it, forgetting that such objects of the distance imagined in the picture could by no means be seen with such hortus siccus minuteness. A few years later in 1857, Ford Maddox Brown, another Pre-Raphaelite painter, made this highly detailed watercolour of the view from his studio at his home in Hampstead, North London, shown here on the, on the left. As Alan Staley has noted, in this landscape and other works by Brown from this period, quote, the subject is Brown's own landscape, the view he sees every day from his window, unquote. The time and patience which Marianne North devoted to painting this rather mundane view from the veranda of the house where she was staying at the Moho Velu gold mine in Minas Gerais is in keeping with earlier pre-Raphaelite practices. By adhering to the principle of truth to nature rather than the picturesque for her oil paintings, North places the audience in her own shoes, showing us the landscape as it looked rather than how it should look. She did not correct nature or idealize the scene. And my research will hopefully go on to examine further these differences uh, between earlier uh, British artists who travelled to Brazil and later artists from later in the 19th century, considering how the approach to the Brazilian landscape changed uh, across throughout the century, moving from a more picturesque view of the landscape to something uh, closer to nature, um, in, inspired in part by the art of the Pre-Raphaelites. Thank you very much.